The Colonel Abroad, a sketch from real life, by Anna Cora Mawat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Taylor The Colonel Abroad A few springs ago, it was impossible to display one's gay attire in Broadway without becoming acquainted with the person of my hero, Augustus Blazon, Esquire. The reader, who may have never rightly caught his name, will recognize him when I call to mind an individual who usually dazzled the public eye with a bright blue or green coat, crimson vest, and a greater quality of jewelry gracing that portion of his breast in which Momus recommended a window than would have shown to an advantage through one of Tenney's double-sized panes. So exceedingly slender was this gentleman that the cane, with its monkey head, which he invariably carried, bore no slight resemblance to himself, but the material of which nature had stinted him in breadth, she conscientiously returned him in height, he stood some six foot two in his boots. His pliant form was surmounted by a head in which shape, I might almost say in size, forcibly reminded me of that most insipid fruit, a shaddock. Doubtless some malicious persons would add that the simile might be carried out, and a comparison made between the quality of the head and the shaddock's contents, but far be it from me, conversant as I am with Mr. Blazon's own peculiar talents, to be guilty of the detraction. Augustus Blazon, when I first beheld him, was a man seeking his proper sphere in society. This he did not seem likely to find. His father was a shipbuilder, and had left him considerable property, sufficient, it might be supposed, to purchase the entree to that society in which he was calculated to cut a figure. Yet, strange to say, both he and his wealth were then totally unappreciated. He was a very ill-treated person, the butt of waggish young gentlemen, and the bore of fashionable young ladies. It was astonishing with what lack of discernment people of the Halton declared that his manners were vulgar in the extreme, that he was uneducated, a booby, a bear, and those without daughters even went so far as to declare that his presence, in spite of his money, would be a disgrace to their balls. Augustus endured the horror incident upon this verdict, but one winter, after he became of age, he suddenly disappeared from Broadway, and for a year I entirely lost sight of him. The ensuing autumn I was standing in the gallery of the Louvre before one of David's most felicitous productions when my attention was arrested by a person of aspiring stature beside me. His face recalled some face once familiar to my eye, but the long curling hair in color and shagginess somewhat resembling a setter's the bushy whiskers and sandy moustache so disguised those diminutive features that I could not recognize to whom they belonged. Upon the gentleman's arm leaned a lady whose comfortable embonpoint recompensed the eyes for the lanky spareness of her escort. To pronounce the lady's beauty is a delicate point. I leave the reader to judge her attractions. A horseback ride on the Champs-Élysées could alone have given her cheek that exceedingly brilliant bloom. The most celebrated powder in Paris certainly must have assisted in lending those strangely regular teeth. 
displayed by a perpetual smile, their dazzling whiteness. Nature seldom before clustered such a profusion of glossy black ringlets around a white forehead, or tinted brows so jetty a hue, or vermilioned lips so exquisitely. In the eye alone she had made an error. It was decidedly too small for the lovingly languidness of its expression. As for the lady's age, it might have been considered a compliment to call her actually young. At all events, she was blooming still had made the best of time and time returned the compliment and treated her genteelly what a thrilling and beautiful tableau softly murmured the lady pausing before a picture which represented a group of cupids sportively loosening their bows tolerably executed quite possible not at all remarkable however said her critical companion. Here is a much finer. And he pointed out a dark painting in which the figures were obscured by a shade so deep they were hardly visible. Ah, oh, Colonel, you are such a connoisseur. It is dangerous to express opinion before you, sighed the lady. Well, really, I do pride myself on some taste in these matters. When a man has traveled all over Europe, it is to be expected that he should be a judge of the fine arts. I have no doubt after a trip to Germany and Italy, you may be as content as myself to pronounce upon them. Bear one thing in mind, whenever you see a dark, dingy picture, you may be sure it is worthy of praise, certainly by a master." obscurity is the greatest mark of beauty but persons must travel to discover these things the couple passed on and i lost sight of them until we met in the halls of statuary between the extensive gallery here i observed that the gentleman induced his companion to pause before every remarkably worn and discolored statue or decayed relic, pointing out to her their hidden beauties, but hurrying by all the most attractive works of art that were unmarked by this defacing seal of time. Shortly afterwards we were waiting at the entrance of the palace for our voiture de Romy, which had driven away, when the colonel and his blooming lady passed us on the steps they entered an elegant carriage which drove up to receive them but before the door was closed the sprucely liveried footman begged to make monsieur la cornelle acquainted with a person who had some valuable relics veritable curiosités that were really worth monsieur la cornelle's examinations relics let me see them by all means enthusiastically exclaimed the colonel i am making a collection to take to america i know well enough when they are genuine come here fellow quave qu'est que 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 avez vous tout sorti de choses monsieur à votre service tout ce que pouvez désir replied the antiquarian frenchman opening his large box Voyez, fig voyez uh, je me moi said the colonel with the air of a man who knew very well what he was saying if only he could keep from stammering montrez a monsieur interpreted the officious footman putting his own hand into the box monsieur has so much bon goût here monsieur le colonel is a nail actually taken from the cross it has been in the possession of some monks hundreds of years of course such a relic is a little expensive and here is one of saint anthony's teeth and here a bottle of holy water consecrated by the pope himself and here is a vial containing some of the apostle peter's tears and here i could not catch the names of the other invaluable contents of the box but 
I observed that a number were stowed into the carriage. When the Frenchman was paid, the footman, while he closed the coach door with his right hand, stretched out the left, significantly open, behind him. The dealer in antiques slyly laid a piece of money within it, and the footman, turning around, his mouth twitching with suppressed laughter, gave a glance at the other sufficiently expressive and comical. As the carriage drove off, we were joined by a countryman, who bowed to the colonel and lady as they passed. "'My dear S,' said I, with an inquisitive haste, "'in all the name of all that is original, tell me who is the individual to whom you bowed?' why surely you have not forgotten him in spite of all of the metamorphosis affected by the salt atlantic indeed i have pray who is he has he lost all resemblance to augustus blazon of broadway memory is it possible but the lady calls him colonel to be sure and a colonel he is without doubt he had himself made a colonel before he left america on purpose to gain a travelling title but the lady who is she she is a charming widow madame de courtenay an englishwoman it is reported of immense fortune and of high rank niece to a lord i have heard her say she is passing the winter in paris and her business is probably to procure an eligible life partner her apartment garni is in the rue rivoli and are as splendid as any in paris and you saw her coach just now nobody seems to understand how she got into society but as i said before the french are not scrupulous colonel blazon has been paying her attention some time and she introduces him everywhere i hear they are now engaged she believes him worth ten thousand pounds a year a colonel in the regular army and his very remarkable escouchon unblemished and genuine indeed she often expresses a strong desire to make america a permanent residence are your suspicions of the colonel never avowed oh of course not communicativeness is not the fashion here everybody minds his own business you will so soon learn that it is very possible that both madame de courtenay and colonel blazon when they are fairly married may discover each other to be somewhat different from what they now seem to be all in due time but that is entirely their own affair well no place like paris for acquiring the real sang froid i must have less curiosity before i am possessed of it i fear not too many days after this conversation my friend joined us one evening at tortoni's over an ice and related with real enjoyment whether it was of the ice or of his own story i do not pretend to judge the concluding scene of the colonel's adventures in paris monsieur le colonel was sitting in the very tasteful boudoir of madame de courtenay a few mornings previous to the one fixed for their anticipated union madame in a very rich velvet robe was reclining on the graceful car sofa complacently surveying luxuries around her and making a calculation of those which were wanting and which the colonel would doubtless supply the walls of the room were hung and the table covering with drawings to which her own name was attached a number of musical instruments were elegantly scattered about and on some one of these the colonel was entreating her to play but the piano she said she had relinquished for the harp after which it sounded harshly on her ear unfortunately several strings of the harp had been broken ever since her acquaintance with the colonel she could touch the guitar to please him but her voice was affected by a cold and the instrument was nothing without a vocal accompaniment in short she preferred to hear him read one of the numerous poems addressed to herself which she had bound in stamped velvet covers to grace her centre table 
the colonel was employed in giving voice to the madam's versified praises when a lady and gentleman entered with whom madame de courtenay had but recently become acquainted they happened to be americans the lady saluted madame who rose from her reclining position to receive her looked down at the colonel as though he were not wholly unknown and seated herself without any sign of recognition passing between them the american gentleman however whose manners and exterior were decidedly un parisian immediately crossed to the colonel with how do you do mr blazon so you're in paris are you i heard you cut new york stupid place is it not the people are so deuce particular it makes society here so much preferable we arrived ourselves about a fortnight ago how are your sisters mr blazon quite well i thank you mr andrews said the colonel trying to seem cool while the hue of his very fingers evinced a superabundance of the caloric madame appeared to be discomposed an ominous pause ensued it was broken by an unceremonious mr andrews are you going to remain in paris all winter mr blazon i guess it's just the place for you to pick up acquaintances go about build more at home than actually when one is at home i probably that is i uh, might stay said the colonel glancing at the alarmed countenance of madame then suddenly gaining courage he began to talk with great fluency threw open madame's portfolio for the inspection of the visitors and effectually monopolized all the conversation for heaven's sake colonel whispered madame de courtenay why does that gentleman call you mr blazon i'll tell you my dear madam said the colonel confidentially it's uh, really a misfortune he is the most absent man in the world never knows what he's saying and has the worst memory yes he cannot bear to be corrected therefore it is better to take no notice of him mr blazon said mr andrews i suppose you find all the balls here quite as splendid as the assemblies in new york for which we have such difficulty in getting our ten dollar tickets don't you really mr andrews you must be thinking of some other person to what assemblies do you allude dear me he continued drawing forth with an air of expressement how time flies i am very sorry madam i have an engagement at this hour which calls me from you i will fulfil it and with your permission return in time to accompany you to the bois de boulogne good morning after the colonel left madame's regret as his absence must have affected her conversational powers for she spoke with an obvious effort with her visitors she was but slightly acquainted and felt a natural delicacy in introducing the subject uppermost in her thoughts at last when the lady rose to leave madame de courtenay fearing the opportunity for inquiry might not be again offered demanded rather abruptly were you acquainted with colonel blazon in america the gentleman who just left the apartment i presume you mean madame no and there was a slight expression of haughtiness in the lady's tone he is not among the number of my acquaintance the colonel is a friend of yours sir persisted madame de courtenay the colonel what colonel colonel who ma'am colonel blazon who just left the room i knew a mr augustus blazon in new york but i never heard of him being a colonel before oh sir but he said your memory was so treacherous you madame may not be acquainted with him but you have heard of him i have madame frequently and he is a colonel then i knew it was a mistake yes i certainly believe him to be a colonel i presume that you are aware of the existence of the militia 
and that in America a man from almost any class of the community may become a militia colonel or even a general. Mr. Blazon is a colonel, doubtless, but it is a militia colonel. Is it possible? What will become of me? I am bewildered. My dear madam, will you open that door, sir? Camilla! My soul, Voltio, this room is so close. Pray, who is this gentleman, then? A very good fellow in his way, replied Andrews. Only considered rather soft for a Yankee, but I guess he does well enough here. His father has built many a good ship, and he is his son. That's who he is. But you will excuse me, said Madame de Courtenay, with a manner of a drowning person catching at a straw. He is very wealthy, worth ten thousand pounds a year, is he not? Ten thousand pounds? We do not calculate by the pounds in our country, replied the lady. I suppose, Mr. Blazon, for he is rich. Rich? He is really rich, then. And the salvotille became suddenly efficacious, for the lady obviously revived. Yes, quite well off. His property yields him from two to three thousand dollars a year. Three thousand dollars? Merciful powers! That would not support such an establishment as this in three months! Camilla! Excuse me, I am ill. A sudden pain! And Madame de Courtenay sank on the sofa and hid her face with her handkerchief. Her visitors, observing themselves decidedly de trop, wished her a speedy relief and left her to the consoling care of her pretty femme de chambre, Camilla. I am ruined, Camilla, sobbed the afflicted widow. The colonel, Colonel Blazon, is a militia colonel. Tinkers and tailors can be militia colonels. His father's a shipbuilder, and the wretch he has only worked three thousand dollars a year, not ten thousand pounds. We shall never see America at all. What a horrid place it must be. Everything will be discovered here. We shall have to leave Paris and hide ourselves in Sheltingham. The little my poor husband left me is just hush dear madame said the maid he comes the colonel the colonel entered hastily what ails you dearest lady said he with unaffected anxiety speak to me look at me and the gentleman tremblingly knelt beside the sofa on which the fair sufferer was lying supported by her confidential grisette speak to you look at you sir said the lady uncovering her distorted countenance how you have deceived me betrayed me on regard madame do not toss your head so prudently whispered camilla those classical puños are so bad they have let your hair slip all on one side i deceive you i fairest of created beings said the colonel devotedly i would rather lose my life can you believe anything that vulgar fellow andros could say a plague on his absent-mindedness i shall send him a challenge to-morrow will that make you a colonel or a man of honour either blazon oh i am too wretched madame dear madame again whispered the maid you forget yourself in your excitement. Pray, do not weep, madame. Your cheeks will be all marked. Your toilette is frightfully abîmé. Listen to me, my dear madame. I assure you that whatever Andrews might have said was out of spite. Should anything shake your tender confidence in me after the promise you have given, you said this little white hand. Do not touch me, perspidious man. Oh, I am ruined. What will become of me? Perfectly regardless or unconscious of the colonel's presence, the lady raved on. I shall be turned out of these elegant apartments, and my coach, my saddle-horses, my box at the opera, Camilla, 
Do you suppose they put women in prison for debt in this barbarous country? What shall I do? The colonel sprang from his knees as though a thunderbolt had burst near him. He looked at the weeping fair one with unutterable horror depicted on his countenance. Calcine, madame is a little out of her head, monsieur le colonel. She does not know what she is saying. Oh, c'est diable de la vie mignon. Uh, how it got off her lips. <laughs> the colonel, for a moment or two, was incapable of motion. When animation was restored, he turned around, seized his hat, caught hold of the door handle, clenching it as though he was afraid of being forcibly detained, flung open the door with an ejaculation of what an escape, and vanished. The footman, who met him racing down the stairs, told Camilla that Monsieur Le Cornel rubbed his hands exultingly as he ran, and that he heard him repeating to himself, What an escape! What an escape! That Andrews is the best friend I ever had in my life! After half a year's sojourn in Paris, we returned to America. The colonel had sailed for New York immediately after his denouement, with the charming widow, and as I felt the interest in him which every student of human nature takes in the fate of a decided character, I questioned a friend as to his farther history. Do you mean Colonel Blazon, as he is now generally called, though he seems to have got his title abroad? The Traveller, was her reply. He is in New York, and a great personage here, I assure you. You may see him any day on Broadway, with his elegant span of horses driving his liveried footmen about. He has created a great sensation since his return. He is quite the rage, is received in first society, and is the avowed pet of all mamas. His reception abroad must have been exceeding flattering. His adventures are in everybody's mouth. The people are running crazy about his paintings and statues and relics and curiosities. I don't know much about it, but they say his collection is invaluable. End of The Colonel Abroad by Anna Cora Mollett. Recorded by Kelly Taylor.